stream, uh, upstream part of the river system is pretty darn narrow. And it's got a canopy that will close over uh, most of the stream itself, um, which lends itself to really beautiful uh, habitat and um, uh, pretty good bird watching as well, because a lot of the birds you're, you know, hanging out on the branches overneath the over the um, the river. So um, if you go a little bit downstream, you get to a place where there's somebody with a red pickup truck. And actually, this is near um, Spring, Springdale, and this is actually my buddy, Keith Bradley. And I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce you to Keith Bradley. If you don't already know who he is, he is the new botanist at the um, at South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. And he's the botanist within the Heritage Program who has taken over the... Uh, retired Burt Pittman's um, per position. Let me just suggest, I'll just nominate <laughs> Keith here to be one of your speakers sometimes, because he is just dynamite as a botanist of uh, not only South Carolina, but Georgia and Florida as well. And I just uh, thought it would be kind of fun to show, we went on a little field trip. We weren't in a kayak, but we went in his little red truck and botanized, um, or still in Orangeburg County, um, we found this beautiful, beautiful stand of wild rice. And you all probably know this is Zizania aquatica, uh, which is just a gorgeous thing to see, mostly in freshwater systems. Of course, you can, some of you all that have been near the marsh will have seen a very close relative called Zizaniopsis which is also um, sort of a wild rice and looks a lot like this, but it's pretty technically different in having male and female flowers. Whereas this wild rice, Zizania, has perfect flowers. And the reason that there's a big picture of Keith's finger is because he got it cut on the edge of that leaf. So beware if you ever start playing around with this stuff or with a lot of other grasses too. I want to show you one of my former undergraduate students. <laughs> and this is um, Jeff Brannon, who's already long graduated and he's gotten a pretty profitable job, I hope. Um, no, I know where he is. He still lives in Lexington County. And Jeff was doing a project for me as an independent study a student. Uh, looking at the plant life uh, along the river in Aiken State Park. Um, and this was a really, really wonderful uh, trip that we had. And on the left, you see him smiling and being happy and dry. On the right, you see where we were under the bridge and his kayak turned over, dumped him into the freezing water, and he stood up burying his chest and muttering oaths and saying how cold the water was. And it is kind of wonderful on a hot summer day if you can slip into this water. So another reason to be checking this out. Okay, so as we keep going downstream, we're gonna ultimately come to the confluence of the two forks and the main body of the Edisto River. And we enter a, a much broader channel, which is surrounded at least a little bit on both sides with um, bottomland hardwoods and cypress. So this is a kind of a characteristic scene of uh, uh, a fairly high water shot of the Dorchester side of the river, not too far from Mars Oldfield Landing. Um, and as you see, there's these characteristic um, cypress knees and also back in the background, you can see um, uh, tupelo gum, and then a bunch of uh, emergent uh, wetland uh, vegetation coming up on the edge. A very dark, beautiful, uh, even on a sunny day, just these wonderful shadows that you can play around with and um, good for bird watching. And again, some of you all probably know more about prothonotary warblers than I do, but they are here in the summer and lots of fun to look at. 
Also within this vegetation, one can frequently find a little plant called, um, you know, I don't know what it's called. I don't think it has a common name. And the reason is most people don't know anything about it. But we could call it purple water leaf if you wanted to. But this is a plant that's called Hydrolea quadrivalvis. And, you know, maybe Bob will um, circulate a, a list of all these scientific names. Would that be fun? Just nod your heads if you think that would be fun. <laughs> but this plant is just kind of remarkable to me because its flowers are so pretty. Five bright purple petals and these very succulent stems. And you think, oh, what fun it would be to grab this plant and study it. Well, you got to be real careful because this is one of the spiniest plants that you could ever find, a spiny herbaceous plant. So it's one that you want to take, uh, take great care if you do happen upon it. In fact, we're not supposed to be pulling up wildflowers anyway. So, But it is a pretty plant. Hydrolea is the name. And um, a little bit farther downstream from that, <clears throat> A good many species of Hypericum occur in South Carolina, and some of them are pretty honest to goodness uh, wetland species, such as this one, which best I can determine is um, Hypericum densiflorum. It's definitely the genus Hypericum, and you've probably heard of this common name, St. John's wort, and this is one of them that we have along the river five bright yellow petals that you can see, and lots and lots of stamens. And then there's, of course, a pistil in the middle of the flower. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's a, one of the uh, prettiest bright yellow plants along the river. Um, okay, so our kayaks continue to drift with the current. You don't hardly have to paddle at all. It just takes you along, takes you down there by itself. And you come to a place like this. Oh boy. So as you all have, have seen from aerial photography, a lot of these southeastern rivers, and certainly those in South Carolina, really start to bend around and wave around on the ground as they enter the coastal plain from farther up upstream. And the reason for this is they're losing uh, energy. And so the the channels are typically are not so, so much straight anymore, but weaving around and forming in some places oxbow lakes. Now these curves are really interesting um, for a number of reasons. The curve in the river, the outside curve of the river is where the water is the fastest. It makes sense with, from physics. Don't ask me why, I wasn't very good at physics in college. The inside curve, though, is where the water is slowest, and it's all about friction or something. So you got fast water on the opposite side and slow water on the inside of the curve, sort of like there's a concave out there and a convex on the inside. All this slowed water, a lot of sediment is going to start falling out of it. And so that's how sandbars are formed. So these sandbars can be quite extensive, not only along the Edisto, but uh, the Congaree as well, and then other um, coastal plain settings. And they offer a, a wonderful opportunities for, for plants to live, in, such as a number of woody species like uh, black willow. And that's what this is. Um, black willow is the dominant willow in the coastal plain of the state and certainly along the Edisto. And these places obviously are also really good for um, young men or people, whoever, to park their kayaks and have um, a lunch of roasted brats and homemade beer, that sort of thing. Um, we do that in my little group, which is called Low Country Unfiltered, which I'll... Um, <laughs> I'll say a few more things about that later. But these sandbars are kind of wonderful places. Now, if you're ever on the Edisto at a time of high water, a sandbar, a sandbar will look something like this. 
At low water, the beach will be much more extensive and reach out towards the central channel. Um, so it makes a, a pretty big deal of difference what, uh, what the season is when you're going kayaking down the Edisto. You gotta watch the weather. A lot of times, um, high water will get you, get you to places faster uh, and that's sort of an advantage, whereas at low water, um, there could be potential problems with running into stumps and sunken logs, that kind of stuff. But anyway, one of my buddies is named um, Jimmy Steinmetz, and he's in the uh, Low Country Unfiltered group. <laughs> and we jumped out on one of these sandbars, and he posed with this beautiful specimen of river birch which is a native species and has real flaky bark. Uh, it scales off once it gets any age on it and uh, actually becomes a, a pretty handsome street tree. That, and so a lot of people in this state will grow river birch, uh, Betula nigra, in their front yards like my, my next door neighbor does. And um, so there's Jimmy, like looking a little bit stoic, but above him you can see the um, catkins, the female flowers of the uh, plant. These are all dried up because it was in the summer, but this thing blooms in the spring like most good birches do. And of course, eventually those catkins will disintegrate and the little uh, winged fruits, one-seeded fruits will flutter away and start up a new birch somewhere. Uh, okay, there are some good many other woody plants obviously as well as herbaceous plants and so i guess we're sort of entering a kind of a cavalcade of of botany here <laughs> uh, on the left um again i've already mentioned um ball cypress well i've mentioned cypress but the all the cypresses along the edisto are ball cypress um, which is taxodium disticum so tax Taxodium is the genus for both of the cypresses that we have in this state. Uh, the other cypress is called pond cypress. And that's the one that you would see at some place like um, um, the, um, the, the state park over there near Lake City. What's it called? The two Carolina Bays that are stuck together. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and pond cypress, not this one, tends to occupy, um, well, ponds or lakes, not flowing water. So uh, both of them occur actually um, uh, in Richland County. And if you do go to say Congaree, this is the one that you'll be seeing ball cypress. No, I believe little... the, I'm sorry, I believe the, uh... Woods Bay has pond cypress over near Lake City. Thank you, Woods Bay. And if you're ever on your way to Darlow Moore's Botanical Garden, you'll go right by it, just about. So if you look down at the bottom of this um, cypress tree, you'll see some beautiful green foliage. And on the right, that's a close-up. So this is our very common, um, or false nettle, which is, it's in the nettle family, but it's not really a, a real nettle because it doesn't sting. So this is Boemeria cylindrica. This is common just about throughout the state, maybe not so much in the mountains, but this is, if you ever go to many wetlands, certainly any riverine wetlands in the state, you'll see this one. And remember now, it looks like stinging nettle, but it doesn't sting. Warning. <laughs> We do have a stinging nettle that looks a lot like this, but it's called Laportia. And it has, um, it has, it looks a little bit different, but its stems are covered with um, little stinging hairs. You gotta kind of watch out for the different, different species of these things in the nettle family. Okay, another woody plant that I'm pretty fond of it is a native hickory, looks sort of like a pecan, but you'll notice that the nuts are flattened and they got uh, four ridges on them. And of course, pecans do that, but they're not really flat like this. 
And this tree, this is a pretty tall tree sometimes, its leaves will have more, more leaflets than your standard run-of-the-mill pecan tree will. So this one is called water hickory. You should be on the lookout uh, for this one too if you're in a um, swampy ecosystem. But the, uh, the fruits are pretty characteristic in being kind of flattened and angular like that. And really no other hickories, at least on the coastal plain, uh, look this. They're beautiful plants. A long time, a lot of times, these uh, trees will be overhanging the river. So it's really easy for a botanist in a, in a kayak to sort of like park underneath it if you can find a convenient vine to hold on to and take pictures. So another one that's very common um, throughout the coastal plain, and I know you've seen, you may even have this in your backyard. This is called cross vine, and you see in the spring, it's got these fantastic flowers, which attract uh, hummingbirds, for one thing, and they're just by themselves, that's a treat in itself, I think. And then, of course, they climb like crazy up um, tree trunks. And uh, the thing about this plant is, if you look closely, on the left side of this, the left picture here, you'll see that at each node of the stem, there's only one leaf. What, you may ask, it looks like two leaves. Not so fast. Each leaf has two leaflets. So the next time you're wandering around and somebody says, oh, look at this vine. It has four leaves at this node. You can say, oh no. It's got two leaves and there's two leaflets. <laughs> My students used to love that. <laughs> it's a beautiful vine to grow if you get a chance to have it on a trellis or something in your yard. And you got to remember now when you're on the Edisto, everything isn't just beautiful wildflowers, but there are also critters to look at. So many uh, zoologists and critter lovers like to um, study the, the um, zoology, the animal life that's along the creek, the stream. And so I just took a picture of a couple of spiders that I thought was kind of interesting and a snake. And now that snake, I, I'm not really sure what it is. Maybe Bob knows or somebody. It must be a, um, it was a pretty friendly snake. I'll let it, it didn't want to visit with us, so it swam away. But a jumping spider, very colorful. Then on the right, a fishing spider. Now what I want you to do is you all know that spiders have eight legs, right? And this one has eight legs. But look at the one on its left side. It's very new. Because for some reason, the first one got chopped off and it grew another one. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and I believe that this genus of this, uh, this is a fishing spider, Dolomedes is the name of it. But I had to look it up because I'm not much of a spider guy. Okay, well, we'll look at a couple other colorful things. Like um, on the left, we have a beautiful um, hibiscus. This is a halberd leaved hibiscus. Um, Hibiscus levis is its name. And on the right is one of my favorite um, hawthorns. This is a, a, all the hawthorns belong to the genus Crategus. And this particular one is common along uh, coastal plain rivers and certainly the Edisto once again. And after, uh, after spring and the early summer, it starts putting on its fruits. And I'll tell you what, they are bright red. And guess what? They are very delicious. So you can pop these in your mouth and chew them up. You got to spit a lot of seeds out, but it's sort of fun playing around with the taste of these things. I recommend it. But you see that the hawthorns are put together sort of like an apple is. In fact, they share the same uh, internal anatomy that an apple would, both being in the rose family. So we keep moving downstream. We're actually getting closer to uh, the estuaries of the coast. And we come to a number of different kinds of plants. 
Um, this particular one, Mitriola, is the genus. It's called miterwort. It's a pretty humble little thing with tiny white flowers, but kind of conspicuous if it's growing uh, in a group. Uh, this particular one is um, Mitriola petiolata. And on the right, I think you can see these kind of uh, three lobe fruits. This is a woody plant that um, is fairly frequent and it's called, um, what it, it's called Sebastiana. That's the common name. It doesn't sound like a common name, but it is. And the scientific name is Dytrocinia fruticosa. So this is a uh, member of the Euphorbia family. Uh, which is a native species, very pretty when it's in fruit. The flowers aren't too much to look at, to be honest. Okay, so um, now to part of the most exciting parts of the river. I hope some of you all have been to the Givens Ferry State Park. Well, if you ever get down to the, um, now what's going on? We're going to go. Givens Ferry State Park, the riverside of the park, is dominated by very steep walls along the river, cliffs basically. So this is this is a, that's the Dorchester side of the river. The opposite side again is Colleton, and it's flat as a pancake. So this speaks to the very interesting geology going on. I was telling you earlier about this uh, very pronounced um, southward bend of the river. This is where it takes place. And these cliffs are made up of marl, which is a sort of a reconstituted kind of limestone. And because of the, chemi the chemistry of marl, they tend to bear plants that really uh, get uh, happy to grow on um, relatively high pH soils. So that is calciphilic plants. And they tend to be a lot different from the others that are in surrounding woodlands that are not on that kind of soil. To give you an example, um, these ferns, this is not a very common fern. In fact, this is a rare fern, only known from a few places in South Carolina. It's called, um, I think it's called something terrible like ovate cliff fern or something like that. Somebody needs to come up with a better common name. But the scientific name is uh, Cristella ovata. Gorgeous, it looks so tropical. And all of these fronds are hanging over us. Oh my God, it was just so pretty. And um, not only that, but uh, in both images, I think you can see a lot of tiny little herbs growing underneath the ferns, including a good many, my phone's ringing, sorry, a good many uh, bryophytes and mo uh, mosses and liverworts. So what a great biology lesson if you ever are lucky enough to be in a some sort of watercraft along the river uh, at Givens Ferry. Take a look. It's a little bit, you know, I mean, you can't climb up this stuff. Don't even try it. It would be too dangerous. And besides, I don't think the park people want you to do that. Well, we keep going downstream, and a botanist sometimes just gets too crazy and starts pulling up plants to turn into specimens for the herbarium. And what can you do? But you got to put your plant press on the front of the kayak, and that makes it a lot easier to study things with both hands free and then put them into the plant press and press them in between the newspapers. I guess we could have another show about how you make specimens sometime, which would be a lot of fun. Um, and if you do try this, be, you gotta be a little bit careful about balancing. <laughs> Cause more than once I've come close to dumping everything into the water, but um, doesn't really matter because the plant specimens can stay wet all day long until I get them back to the lab. But now at this point in the river, we're pretty far downstream. And this is actually uh, near, um, our, this is way down in lower Colleton County. And it's near a place called Cuckold's Creek, if you've ever heard of that. 
And along this stretch of the river, you'll see a suite of new species that you won't see upstream, including this obedient plant. It's not the disobedient plant, but this is a, uh, a coastal plain species called um, Physostegia leptophila. It's not really common, although when I used to work at the Heritage Program, um, we thought it was really rare. Well, we found out it's not as rare as we used to think, just because we've been on these rivers looking around for it um, some years later. So it's one of the prettiest pink uh, blooming flowers along the Edista. Now on the right, I'm afraid this is bad news. And you start seeing more and more of this the farther downstream you go. So this, of course, is our um, famous popcorn tree, which is also in the Euphorbia family. Got really beautiful leaves that are sort of diamond shaped. This plant will actually grow as far inland and set as uh, Colombia, um, at least with protection, but it, it's really not such a good idea to grow it just because it is invasive, especially on the outer coast. It's a horrible woody weed. And um, what's going against that idea is that this is the plant that the um, wreath makers along the coast use to make beautiful Christmas wreaths with those little popcorny things, you know, that are embedded in the, in the vines. It's a, a pretty thing when it makes its fruits. But what you see here are the flowers um, that are in a, a long wiggly spike, sort of yellowish green. Okay, well, we're now in the estuary and moving farther south. Sort of the, the, uh, the Edisto gets much, much broader and slower. And it's also starting to have tidal influence. So you see, this is a river that goes from crystal clear sand hill creeks down to pretty turbid, um, still a blackwater stream, but it's gotten a lot more turbid since it's gone through all these sediments. So a view of the marsh surround uh, both sides of the Edisto. And then I thought this is pretty neat. They have this ancient, ancient um, ball cypress with a tiny human being underneath it in his kayak. This is a, I don't know how old that tree is, but it must be real old, I guess. And what kind of flowers might you find in a marsh along the Edisto? Well, you might find sea ox eye. This is a plant that grows in um, estuaries as well as um, brackish marsh marshes. You can see this if you go on a Polly's Island or Litchfield. Um, Beautiful, it's a member of the sunflower family. Of course, it's got ray flowers and disc flowers. Uh, if you ever like find this in a marsh, I hope you'll chew on a stem. That's right, it will taste salty. <laughs> and then on the right side, you'll see an image of the same plant, only later on in the um, late uh, autumn so that all the, the, the ray flowers have dehissed, fallen off, and what's going on is the plant is in fruit, and the, the, the disc flowers are each producing an A king with a spiny pappus up on top. So it's kind of like a, a, a needly thimble that you might be looking at, but that's C. oxi. And if anybody's interested, the, the species is Borrichia frutescens. Um, okay, I think it's wonderful stuff. Very definitely a marsh plant, but salt mar brackish or salt marsh plant. Okay, uh, and if the water is low enough while you're plying the waves in your kayak, you might see this little thing, which is exposed here because it's low tide, a particularly low tide, and that's just mud on which Spartina is growing just above it. But this little plant is called Liliopsis. Liliopsis, and amazingly, it's in the carrot family. And in the, in the right center of this, the center of this picture, you can see its little fruits. 
and it's sort of an oddball for being in the carrot family. Most carrots have really dissected and cut up leaves. Well, this one has little strap shaped leaves. And this thing goes wild to grow on mud, pluff mud, <clears throat> and it doesn't mind being submerged uh, during high tide. It's just the coolest plant. And it's Liliopsis chinensis. It's real interesting that um, Linnaeus, when he, he was the guy that named this, y'all know who Linnaeus was, um, Carolus Linnaeus, Swedish, you know, the father of plant taxonomy. You know, he had a brother named uh, Ole, and Ole is the uncle of plant taxonomy. It's a joke. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. So Linnaeus named this plant, and he looked at it, and he said, oh, that plant is from China. Nope, he made a big mistake. It's from the southeastern United States. He had just made a mistake. But due to the rules of nomenclature and uh, botanical taxonomy, we can't change the name to something more precise once it's in the books. So it's still called a Liliopsis chinensis, although it doesn't grow in China at all. Go figure. <laughs> okay, well, we're, we're gonna end up our, our, my little presentation here. I just wanna remind you all, Y'all like to have fun, I know. There are various ways to do it at the Edisto. And one of them is you can <laughs> Remember those sandbars we're talking about? A lot of times you'll have trees leaning over and somebody will have tied a big old rope up there. I don't know how they got up there to tie that thing, but the rope has been there for years. And there are several of it, dozens of them along the, the river course. You can tie, climb up there and risk your life by grabbing the grabbing the rope look at the knots on it and swinging yourself into the air like tarzan and you got to know when exactly to let go or you'll come back and run into that tree so it's great fun to do that and a little bit dangerous but a lot of my friends are a little bit crazy too and look there's somebody in this that is start drinking a martini Okay, that's too terrible. So I'm going to kind of thank my buddies, friends, Brucey e. Alexander, Jeff Allen for being a good sport, Keith Bradley for being a good sport, John Sealy is a good sport, and he's my kayaking buddy, and Matt Richardson and the other members of my kayak group, Low Country Unfiltered, and to the nice people at Colleton uh, State Park, um, Givens. Colleton State Park and as well Givens Ferry State Park that have made it um, a lot easier for us to get in and get out of that river. And then my last slide, I just want to show you what some of my buddies look like. <laughs> so we just pulled up to um, take our picture and there we are. So I wish I could talk to you all, but I don't think I can. Maybe we can. Um, sort of reconnoiter uh, elsewhere on Facebook or something and sort of discuss this thing. And I don't know, Bob, can you like break back in with your... Yeah, sure. I, I would like to, um, before before we do that, we have a, we did have a couple of questions that came in. Okay. That um, might, it might be, while you still have your slide deck right up, um, the, yeah. we, had, we had one question about uh, the wild rice that you showed us early in your presentation. I oh, am. Yeah. Um, is wild rice native to South Carolina, to this area? It sure is. Okay. Definitely, no doubt about it. All right. Um, also, your the hawthorn, the beautiful hawthorn that you showed us. What, which hawthorn was that? And are all hawthorns safe to eat? <laughs> um, I'll answer the second question first. All hawthorns are fun to chew on. And I think that and my students used to yell at me because they thought I was always trying to poison them when I tell them to taste this plant. I didn't always say eat this plant or swallow it, but just taste it. 
And if you want to taste a thing, all you got to do is put it in your mouth, maybe one or two, two or three, chew it up, you know, and just see what it's like. And then you can spit it out. And when I do this in front of the students, they just, they scream and yell. And I think that's a lot of fun too. As far as I know, all hawthorns are edible. And in fact, you may have heard of one that's called the May Hall which is a lot of times used elsewhere in the South for jelly. I know they do that a lot in Southern Alabama. And the first part of the question, I've forgotten already. What was that? Uh, which Hawthorn is this? Oh, right. So this is the genus of all the Hawthorns is Crategus. Oh boy, it is a, a mess to try to identify. These species are very complicated. But um, this particular one is pretty easy to identify. Um, and it's called Crategus estivalis. A-E-S-T-I-V-A-L-I-S. Estivalis. Um, you mentioned uh, distributing the, the scientific names, the binomials for these plants. Um, I don't know if you were serious, but if you, if you would like to get together on that, I'll be happy to distribute that list to the, to the group. Um, you asked a question about the snake that you had a photo of. I'm not 100%, but I believe that's uh, Nerodia uh, sipidon, the uh, northern water snake, even though it's oh, yeah. in South Carolina. And um, I was so, you know, the great speckled band, you know, swimming along in that crystalline water. It was gold. It was just so pretty. And look at the, the perfectly clean sand underneath it. Yeah. Yep. Um, one one last question, and then we'll we'll unmute and and go back into our general session. But um, we had one more question that came in about how long it takes to kayak down the Edisto. Okay, I can suggest that um, there are a number of stretches. There's also a friend called a uh, friend, a group called Friends of the Edisto, that you might want to consult with about places that you can put in and take out. You can't do it all at once. It would take, you know, two or three days to go from the very upper end to the coast. But uh, for a good six or seven hour tour, you can do something like, um, well, there, like I said, a number of um, put-ins and take-outs. One that I'm very um, fond of is Mars Oldfield, which is the northern end of Colleton County, all the way to Co to um, Givens Ferry State Park. But you'd have to consult a map. And depending on how long you want to stay on the river, you could take all day or just, you know, a few hours. But I mean, a lot of, a lot of my goofy friends and, and the group get out and I search for fossils and they have their sieves and they're like sieving the sand and looking for shark teeth and stuff. And then we have to have lunch, you know, when it takes a while. And then you got to be watching the weather too. You got to be very careful about this weather business. But you don't want to be on the <clears throat> on the Edisto or any other river when it's uh, storms coming up. <clears throat> so I guess the short answer is <clears throat> it can take as long as you want, but be careful. Consult a map and know where you're going to be putting in, taking out. And if you're, if you're only going with, you might be, have to do some of the shuttling where some people leave their vehicle, their boats up at the upper end, and then somebody's going to take a couple of vehicles down to the takeout and then drive back before everybody gets into the river. Um, looks like we did have one more question come in. Um, Pinus Pelus Palustris natural or replanted in the uplands by the river? Was that a natural occurrence? I guess. Longleaf pine um, is typically, doesn't have anything to do with rivers. It is an upland species, although it can occur in, in Pocosins, that sort of thing. But I don't really know that it has much to do with its distribution by uh, water. Okay. Well, if everybody will bear with us, we're going to try to exit the, the this view and return to return to our presentation. 
to our group meeting. Let's see. And we'll see if we can unmute everyone. Um, you may need to ask everybody, anybody who has a question, go ahead and unmute yourself. All right, I thought I could. Yeah, so um, if you want to, if you can unmute yourself, that might be quicker. I'm working, I'm working on it. But if you have a question, you could unmute and uh, we'll go at it that way. Uh, this is Greg. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good, good. I just asked a question uh, in the chat uh, oh, feature yeah. and it was uh, about the uh, trips that the state park the two state parks, Carlton State Park and Givens Ferry, have, I understand, uh, on a regular basis much of the year down the Edisto, and uh, I think they've got a naturalist with the groups that go down there. Uh, John, I wondered if you knew anything about those folks and whether they include much info about plants. I do not know of <clears throat> specific offerings that they have, although I can't imagine that they don't. I would think it would be a wonderful thing to get into, and I'm sure that their staff is, you know, as knowledgeable or more so than I am about the plant life. So I, if, if you know of how this works, by all means, take advantage of it. And I think, again, though, I think most of the time people are, <laughs> I am mostly interested in being on a kayak during the summer and not so much the winter time, because sometimes you turn over and then you get wet. Thanks, John. Um, I can highly recommend it. It's one of my favorite paddling rivers, and I have um, I've paddled stretches of it a number of times, um, and with my kids from the time they were just you know old enough to put in a boat. And so it's really a very it's a kid friendly uh, river. It's um, it's uh, very forgiving of novice paddlers, though the the upper stretches of the North and South Fork can be a little trickier. They're, the, the river's much more narrow there and has more twists and turns, a lot more trees as you, as you might've seen in some of uh, John's slides. Oh, Getting in that offer. section from Orangeburg on down is, is pretty easy though. Let me offer this also, that in the middle of the summer, hot weather and everybody wants to get on the river, a lot of people do. And um, a lot of people are pretty rowdy and partiers, and there's smoke on the water, and you know, a lot of coolers. So, you know, it's just something, it's part of life, I guess. <laughs> something for everybody. <laughs> I went scuba diving in the Edisto River. The USC Institute of uh, Archaeology had a class on underwater archaeology. We were the first class and we went to, I um, don't remember the name of the place, um, near Jonesboro, I think, or Jack, anyway, down lower. And um, that was my only encounter with a water moccasin uh, underwater. And you come face to face, you look at it, it looks at you, it goes its way, you go your way. <laughs> You pointed out a uh, obedient plan. Is that the same one that you get um, growing gardens? You said it, you thought it was rare for a while, but you see it along the rivers. Is that a different one? Yes, the one that most people have in their gardens, at least here in the Midlands, and including my backyard, is uh, Physostegia uh, virginia virginica, okay. which uh, really has uh, really toothy edges along the margins of the leaf. Whereas this marsh um, obedient plant, um, they're almost smooth. So they're a good bit different. Okay. But I mean, the flowers are pretty much the same. Okay. Oh, I had another question. The water hickory, did you, did you give the species name for it? I, I don't, I can't remember, but the, as, as with all Hickories, the genus is Caria, D A R Y A. Mm -hmm. And this particular one, very distinctive stuff. 
caria aquatica, which kind of makes sense, you know, water hickory. Oh, okay. Do we have other questions? Hey, John, is there much awareness about um, the, the Chinese tallow and um, getting rid of that? Um, when, when we go down to Hilton Head, we see it all over the place. I'm just curious if, if anybody is, is aware of, of that and if there's any sort of effort to kind of stop wow. putting that into, into, you know, beds and that type in, in the landscape, that kind of thing. Yeah. I, I have, I can tell you that there are some people that are aware of the threat that this plant holds, but not enough people. And there may be people in administrative positions such as the Nature Conservancy or maybe even county agencies. I'm not really sure about that. But I don't think the word has gotten out far enough yet. And to have it in your yard, especially along the coast, is I don't think that's a good idea because these seeds will spread. And I remember advising a couple of people who were, lived in Charleston County that this plant came up in their yard and they just thought it was so pretty. And, and I said, well, it's an invasive species and it's just gonna keep spreading. And I talked them into cutting it down, <laughs> which I think was a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen um, wetlands uh, down on the coast of South Carolina completely choked out by, by uh, Chinese tallow. And if you ever go to the Yawkey Center in Georgetown County, uh, they have sometimes have tours of their, um, their landscapes, lots and lots of um, popcorn tree. That came in, this is interesting, most of it came in just after Hurricane Hugo back in eight, uh, 1989. Well, you all weren't even around in 1989. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Charleston in 1989. Other questions? I think Marigold has one. Oh, oh, yeah. I, I wasn't the checking room. the chat. Let's see. We have one in the question. Uh, Marigold said, I have obedient plants in my garden. They're covered in lazy bumblebees all day. Are these likely males waiting for females to visit the flowers? Or and is it common for obedient plants to be bumblebee gathering sites? You got me. I'm not, I don't know too much about bumblebees, although um, you need to take care of your bumblebees. Oh, yeah. That includes carpenter bees, too. But, I mean, I see them in my garden. A lot of times when it's on these cool mornings, they're just, you know, they're in a sort of a state of torpor, and they just don't want to move around too much. They are, uh, they're loving the goldenrod right now. Well, John, thank you so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm, I don't want to speak for everyone here, but I imagine all of us did. And, um, and I think we will also uh, be happy to take you up on your, your offer to do another presentation sometime in I the future for us. I thought you would be. 